I asked you guys to submit questions about difficult workplace questions or difficult clients, and some of the questions are fantastic. And I'm going to start off um, with three different questions. It's this one, this one, and this one. Um, the first one comes from Monkey Circus. How do you, quote, avoid being the type of project leader you hated working for when you were starting out? Well, that was mostly paying attention to how I felt working for a supervisor and then wanting to make sure that I never did that kind of stuff. I've had supervisors shame me. I've had supervisors humiliate me. I've had supervisors performatively dress me down in front of a room. I've had supervisors tell me that the thing I was gonna do was stupid and I was gonna fail at it. I mean, I've dealt with the gamut, uh, as we all have, as every last one of us has. Um, having a job is, uh, it's not, I was gonna say unfortunately, but it really is just like part of being in the working world under late stage capitalism is you'll be saddled, well, I mean really on almost under any economic circumstance. I get, I'm not sure I can state that outright. I mean, at any rate, it's a bigger philosophical question. Bosses be bosses and work be work. And like, you're, we're all gonna deal with that. And I have dealt with the gamut. That was the first question, Monkey Circus. How do you avoid being the type of project leader you hated? Um, a second question that is along the same lines, Susie Revenge says, how do you know if you have a toxic work environment? A really fantastic question. Is there a way to recognize it, including whether you unintentionally may be the cause of it? Another great question. And then Vicki Bly asks a third question, and all three of these I'll address. Um, <clears throat> we ask questions all the time about the people who won't play nice, but how do you deal with the folks that are too helpful? <laughs> too helpful. Um, you're describing, I think, a person who lacks boundaries, which is a really particularly difficult thing to deal with at work. Um, so let's talk about toxic work environments. Um, the first pass that you think of when you think of a toxic work environment is, of course, you know, uh, uh, people that punch down. Um, who? Years and years ago, I read an account from a comedian that got a tour of Saturday Night Live set during its first season, and John Belushi was giving them a tour of the behind the scenes at SNL. And one of the things that Belushi said to the person they were giving a tour at was, I only ever yelled at the executives. I never yell at the staff. And I love this. What he's really saying is, I don't punch down. Um, Tom Hanks gives a little talk about this in uh, 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 Saving Private Ryan, how complaining goes up the chain of command, not down. Um, punching down, i.e. yelling at the staff, yelling at the crew, I think is one of the, like, the, the lowest hanging fruit of crappy workplaces. Um, supervisors who feel like humiliation or shame or belittling or disrespect are ways to run a crew. Um, you cannot demand respect unless you give it. You can only demand respect if you give it. Otherwise you are saying that the rules apply to them and not you. Um, so those aspects of workplaces, uh, belittling, shaming, disrespectful, distrust, hostile, Blame, supervisors who are always looking for someone to blame. Again, these are all low hanging fruits and anti-work, uh, the subreddit, I'm, I spend half of every day on there, uh, is replete with stories of that. But there are more subtle ways to have, have uh, toxic work environments or toxic coworkers. Um, one of them that I have an issue with is people who won't take blame, buck passers. I had a workplace years ago where we had a buck passer, a bright young kid who, they were sort of a legacy hire. There was a little nepotism in their hiring. They were good at what they did, but there was a little nepotism in their hiring. And at the beginning of their work, 
they didn't take a lot of blame for stuff that went wrong. And I'm saying that in a kind of a neutral way because <clears throat> it's not always incumbent on you to take blame for the stuff that you got wrong. Sometimes you just gotta take the blame. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Um, sometimes it's incumbent on you to fall on your sword, especially if I'm a supervisor working under a supervisor and I've got folks, dude, I'm falling on my sword all over the place for my people. I'm not gonna tell them that they screwed up. But this kid was a buck passer. And he always, there was always a reason why something went wrong instead of I'll pay attention, I'll get that better next time. Um, however, and actually, so after about a year of working with this guy, I was like, I don't think I'm ever gonna work with that guy again. And within the next year, he had some epiphany, and I never spoke to him about it, and he ended up becoming one of the best people I've ever worked with. Frankly, it was that like significant of a shift in consciousness. Um, defensiveness is often unwarranted. It is a natural place for us to go, but when you are a supervisor and you hear a but, yeah, no, that wasn't my fault. That's really not the discussion we're having. Uh, again, an, uh, some workplaces place a high level of, 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 of uh, importance on who gets blamed for what. And I have worked for large multinational Fortune 500 companies in which that is the case. Um, one of the things that happens in Fortune 500 companies is they don't like laying lots of people off at once because that's bad for the stock. So they just are constantly laying people off in small ways. And what that yields in terms of a toxic work environment is a situation in which whoever screwed up most recently was the first person to get fired every quarter. And can I tell you what it's like to work for a company like that? They can't make any decisions because Nobody wants to make the wrong decision because it doesn't matter how well you're doing at your job. If you made the most recent wrong decision, you are out. Um, companies that do that do great for their bottom line and they savage their institutional knowledge. That is how you eliminate all your institutional knowledge is constantly trying to lower your payroll costs by firing whoever screwed up most recently. You, you, and when you destroy the foundation of your institutional knowledge, then you just get people who are coming in and reinventing the wheel every single time. Um, complaining. Complaining is a, a, a minor, but it can be a major. Complaining and gossiping can absolutely create a toxic work, work environment. I worked for a guy, I worked, sorry, no, I worked well, um, yeah, no, I'm gonna name this outright, not the person, but I worked on Bicentennial Man in the model shop. Um, we were making hand props. Uh, all the little hand props you saw in, uh, in Bicentennial Man were built in this room in Treasure Island with a whole bunch of my colleagues from ILM, and we did some great work there. It was a really, really fun gig. The supervisor on that, man, he was just the worst supervisor I have ever worked for. I, I'm not even sure I can remember his name. It's fine, because I wasn't gonna mention it anyway. Um, what was so difficult about him as a supervisor? He would insist on how you built something in a way that was unnecessary, micromanaging, and it yielded a poorer product. And it was like enraging to work for him on that front, because you'd be like, you hired me to build a model and now you're stopping me from building it in this way that is efficient, will look good, will be durable. It was like a constant micromanaging. Um, and also on that job was an agitator. There was someone who kept on walking around going, man, they're screwing you, they're screwing you, they're screwing you. Which again, that certainly might be the case. But this guy would be like, Adam, you gotta stop working so fast, man. You're raising the bar here and they're gonna expect more from the rest of us. That, that didn't go well with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna work as fast as I work. Um, that's, that's my, you know, that's how I like to work. Um, Wait, 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 boundaries, right. Folks that are too helpful. So look, I think many of us can identify many toxic workplace environments. I think subtly toxic work environments are environments where there's not a lot of yelling or, uh, uh, or shaming, but it is a blame-based culture. Um, 
But the much better question, and it's one we all ask ourselves, should be asking ourselves all the time, is am I creating work or taking it away? When you are working on a project, you get this area that you are dealing with. And other people have their area that they're dealing with. And when you need a lot of support for your area from other people, you are creating more work than you are doing. Here's a great example. Uh, your relative you haven't seen in a long time comes to your house and you're cooking dinner and they say, can they help? But as they move around their kitchen, they have questions about where every last thing is. And you're spending so much time acclimatizing them to the kitchen that you're not getting your work done. That's fine, that's like what it is to have family and what it is to cook over the holidays. But in a professional environment, that can be a freaking nightmare. And I think we've all worked with people who add drama and labor and decision-making to their portion of the job that is unnecessary. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about my favorite people to work with and what do they do? Well. My favorite people to work with and for over the years have been clear in their speech, clear in their expectations, clear in their critique and advice about moving forward, and they have been what I call self-contained. Like, the problems they're encountering aren't my problems. I am dealing with my problems, and they are dealing with theirs. Um, Self-containment is a great way to ascertain uh, how you are to work with. And for me, I'll admit, I haven't always been the easiest person to work with, not because I punch down, I don't, uh, but I certainly noticed at a certain point on Mythbusters that like, look, I was dealing with a lot on that show. I was in the middle of a divorce for the first two, three seasons. Uh, I was going to court a lot. I was having custody battles about my kids. It was crazy stressful. And there was a moment in which I noticed that the crew was accommodating my mood. Now, if any of my old Mythbuster colleagues are watching this, they're probably smiling. Um, it took me, a, took me a while to realize that. Uh, and I'm not, I, you know, I'm not proud of that. That, that I, I don't want a whole crew adjusting to my mood. I know that I'm the business end, you know, one of the five business ends of this television show, and I got to get this stuff on camera, but like, we all got to get the job done. Um, and I wasn't happy at that thought that I was creating an atmosphere in which people were, and it wasn't like people were again, walking on eggshells around me like I was gonna burst at them because that's not the kind of coworker or boss that I am. But that doesn't mean that it was easy to work around me when I was in those moods. Um, I have said this a lot, but I want my tombstone to say, it was nice to work with. I don't have to be the best person you ever work with, but I'd like to be nice to work with. I'd like, to, I'd like us all to get the job done. Um, wonderful questions. Uh, Monkey Circus, uh, sorry, yeah. Monkey Circus, Susie Revenge, and Vicky Bly. I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate that. The, asking yourself about what creates a hostile or toxic or difficult work environment is a process. Again, it's, and if you Google, like I did before this live stream, ways of identifying toxic workplaces, there are tons of wonderful lists that people have concocted that include much of this and some stuff that I, that I added. Okay. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects. Questions, you get to ask direct questions during my live streams and we have some members only videos, including the Adam real time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.